Thank you. It really is a joy to be with you. Thankful for the invitation uh, and the opportunity to, to look into Confession Chapter 2. Uh, there is no chance that we get through Confession Chapter 2, uh, and so I've, I'm not going to try to cover the entirety of that. That is, again, an, an infinite an infinite topic. Um, two things by way of house clearing. Uh, no, I didn't wear a tie, and I normally do. Living in Philadelphia, it's, it's pretty standard. You wear a tie, and I thought, you know, I'm coming to California. I'm going to go without a tie, and then Richard Barcellus gives me grief about not wearing a tie. I have one for tomorrow, but uh, the thing is, I did see a video of you leading an entire session without a tie or a jacket, so I think that's the end. That's the last I'm going to hear about the tie, uh, and uh, it'll be back tomorrow, and yeah, <laughs> no, I've, it's, anyway, so I've, I've, got the, I've got the dirt on that. And then the other thing is, uh, Dr. Renahan asked us five questions in the last session, and I, I'm sure that all of you felt the challenge of those questions like I did, but I do have to say that he previewed those by me this morning when I was still in my jammy pants eating toast. <laughs> and you think you had it hard. I hadn't even finished my first cup of coffee yet, and he had hit me with those questions. So, uh, yes, challenging, but... Uh, important things for us to think about. For this first session, this lecture, uh, again, I'm going to depart from my, from, uh, my normal uh, presentation in, in sermonic form, and we will get into some issues. We will talk about some personalities, what, what's at stake. What I've done for this first talk is really taken as my, my challenge to give a sort of broad assessment of the current state of theology proper in evangelicalism. That's too broad itself. What I really want to do is assess the state of theology proper, more specifically, in Calvinistic evangelicalism. Uh, how are things in broadly Calvinistic evangelicalism uh, with respect to the doctrine of God? And some things we're going to have to say in this lecture are, are hard things, but things that we need to contemplate. The way that I have, the way that I have set this up is by looking at, at classical Christian theism as, as one model, which is what we have in Confession Chapter 2, and what I'm calling theistic personalism. That language is not original with me, but we'll open that up. I want to begin with a text of Scripture, a familiar one to us, Malachi Chapter 3. The Lord reminds these, these stubborn returned exiles of the southern kingdom why it is that they are not consumed, and he says, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. That the Lord does not change. That the Lord our God is, in fact, immutable, as our confession says. To give an even-handed assessment of the state of theology proper in evangelicalism would be nigh on impossible. I want to narrow, again, myself a little less ambitious, perhaps, by looking in particular at certain trends within evangelical Calvinism. Some of the personalities that I'll bring up will be personalities that have taught uh, persons who have taught us, who have instructed us, uh, whose teaching has benefited us, and yet there are aspects of their teaching that I think are leading us in a direction, not just away from our confession, but away from traditional Catholic orthodoxy. And I say Catholic in that best sense, in that, in that Nicene Creed uh, sense of Catholic. And our, our doctrine, I'll say this up front, our doctrine in Confession Chapter 2 is not a Baptist doctrine. In fact, interestingly, it's not even a Protestant doctrine, technically speaking. It's, it's a Catholic Orthodox doctrine. The Reformation was not the total demolition of all that had gone before. Uh, it, was not the, it was not intended to upend uh, 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 historic Christian Orthodoxy. If anything, it sought to solidify that. It sought to, it sought to preserve the Orthodoxy of what had gone before while correcting some perceived errors in that tradition. So I'll begin by, the, I'll begin by saying this, that though a doctrine of God, as we have it in our Confession Chapter 2, is in a Baptist Confession, it's not a Baptist doctrine. It's not a Reformed doctrine. It is really a Christian doctrine, a piece of that, a piece of that classical orthodoxy that we inherited. And I think our forebears wisely sought to preserve. That being, that being said, uh, those who want to depart from that, condition, uh, that tradition do need to contemplate exactly what the ramifications are of their departures. Ordinarily, and I'm going to make this argument uh, this evening, ordinarily people don't like to be told that they are departing from their tradition. Uh, 
Calvinists don't like to be told that they're not really very Calvinistic, just like Lutherans don't like to be told how they are not really in keeping, step, keeping in step uh, with Luther. There's a, di- there's a difficulty in, in, the, in current strands of Calvinistic evangelicalism, which there is, I think, a departure from classical Protestant orthodoxy, Catholic orthodoxy as we have it in our confession. It's difficult to describe this trend in a single term, but if I could use one way of describing it, I would call it theistic personalism. What do I mean by theistic personalism? At first glance, the name theistic personalism doesn't sound too bad. After all, isn't God a personal God? He subsists in three persons who are eternally in fellowship with one another, in perfect union, one substance, but also mutually indwelling. Also, we seek to have personal fellowship with God. John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, that whosoever believe in him should not perish but have eternal life, that he invites us in, in, in sending his Son and in pouring forth his Spirit to join ourselves in faith to him in communion with the triune God. First John 1 John 1.3, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Theistic personalism, classical theism, aren't we saying the same thing? We all want to affirm a personal God. No doubt our patristic and medieval reformed and Puritan forebears, held forth the prospect of the sinner's reconciliation to God and of the benediction of unbroken fellowship with him in glory. That is is eternal life, to know God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent, to to enjoy God, to have our beatitude, our benediction in the enjoyment of God. Maybe an earlier generation would have called it the beatific vision, to, to possess God as our eternal great reward. That is our ambition. So what is theistic personalism offering that, some, that, that disrupts that true and good ambition of the human heart? In particular, theistic personalism is in effect making the argument that in order for God to be truly personal, he needs to somehow enter into relationship with us in a give and take sort of way. If God cannot change or be affected by the world, the idea is, then our relationship to him seems overly one-sided and thus rather impersonal and non-dynamic. If the world and if his creatures do not have some impact on him, if we do not change him uh, and affect him in some way, then there's something profoundly impersonal in that. Moreover, the Bible depicts God uh, seemingly as ensconced within human history. This is the God who, whose wrath burns at one moment and then turns his, way wrath, his, turns his wrath away at another. The God who says that he went with Israel in the fire and in the cloud through, through uh, the wilderness. Uh, this is the God who is with them, who sojourns with them. Uh, is this not a God who has, in a certain sense, historicized himself in order to enter personal relations with us? This seems to be a very straightforward read of Scripture. The God who loves me and the God who seeks to be in fellowship with me and who invites me into that fellowship by His Spirit and in His Son is a God who, in a certain sense, needs to have taken on some historical reality, some give-and-take way of being so that He can come near to me. These are the components that make personal relationships personal, dynamic reciprocity, give and take. We act on God, and he receives that action from us, and vice versa, God acts on us and causes certain events in our life. The replacement model, then, of classical theism is intended to be, basically, to say that the strong account of God's immutability Make, getting rid of God's immutability makes space for genuine give and take with God in an interpersonal way. That if we, if we can say that God changes in some way, somehow, maybe not his nature, but other aspects of his being, say, do we not thereby make him more personal? The classical concern and response is this, that the the concern from the classical perspective is that the notion of human personal relations, in which we really do have give and take relation to each other, has been set up as the ideal and that God is now being thought to exist and act in ways that belie the perfection of his, and fullness of his being. In other words, God begins to be, in some slight and innocent seeming ways, what he was not before. 
What's more, and I will make this argument, it will not do to say that God can change or will changes for himself as long as he's controlling the changes in himself. And this is, this is in fact, the, the way in which many modern Calvinistic evangelicals have gone. They have said, we need to get away from this doctrine of absolute immutability because absolute immutability doesn't seem very personal, doesn't seem very reciprocal. Therefore, we need to allow a little, some kind of change in God but in order to make sure that things don't get out of hand, we also need to make sure that God controls the changes. Okay, maybe this goes back to Dr. Renahan's question. Does God's sovereignty mean that God is sovereign over himself? This notion of self-sovereignty, I'm going to submit, is, is a rather new and novel development in theology. And while Calvinists love sovereignty, and we love talking about divine control, uh, I am gonna challenge whether this notion of control has to do with God's own activity of will toward his own being. That seems to me something unprecedented in the history of, of Western orthodoxy, or of, of Christian orthodoxy in general. So we'll come to that. In this context, contest then between classical theism and theistic personalism, in some respects, the contest may, bet may be between the older Calvinism and the newer. I don't mean that everyone who travels under the name New Calvinist uh, is necessarily a theistic personalist. That would be, that would be unfair, uh, but many, many do, it seems to me, fall into that kind of personalist uh, way of thinking. I'll first attempt to briefly articulate the older view of God's self-sufficiency and his immutability. So we'll just set out the basic claims of the classical doctrine as it was meant uh, by, our, by our forebears. Next, I'll set forth the, the theistic personalist claims of certain modern Calvinists. Who are these that are making new claims about God's relationship to the world? What exactly are those claims? Uh, thirdly, we'll talk a little bit about this notion that God is somehow sovereign over himself. I want to make a few comments in that regard, and then finally we'll consider exactly what, what is at stake in this context, this contest between classical theism and theistic personalism. All right, first then, the self, I want to consider the self-sufficient and the unchanging God of classical theism. Why do we say in our confession to one that God is immutable? Why do we say that he is, that he is not susceptible to change? Why do we say that God cannot become what he was not? Uh, that's, or, or cease to be what he was, the, uh, the other side of that doctrine. At the heart of it, classical Christian theism is devoted to the absoluteness of God with respect to his existence, his essence, and activity. That there is no, there is no explanation for God, there is no, deep, there is no explanation for God's being, for God's essence, that is in some way deeper than God or other than God. God, in short, if I could put it this way, God is the reason for God. God is the full self-sufficient explanation and reason for himself. God is not derived or caused to be. God does not become, he is. Older writers, we would have said, God is being, not becoming. As, a, as, an, as an absolute claim. God is being, not becoming. There's nothing back of him or outside of him that could increase him, alter him, augment him his infinite fullness of being and felicity. God is God, infinite in being, in the fullness uh, of his deity, and does not become what, he's is not, what he was not, does not have some actuality of being that is added to him. For this reason, then, he cannot choose to subject himself to causes. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite you to enter into an older way of talking. We're going to talk, we're gonna talk about ontology, all right, you're still there. I uh, didn't see anybody collapse. When we say ontology, what we mean is the, uh, is the theory or the doctrine of being, that which ha the, the study of being, that which has to do with what is. That is what is, when I say ontological or ontic, I mean being, what is. When we talk about causes, we're talking about that which makes something to be. At the very baseline, every cause, every cause is a determination of being of some sort. Every cause gives some kind of actuality of being to that which it causes. If I, if I, cause, if I cause this cap to lift up in the air, I am making it to be elevated. See what I'm getting at? All causes give being of some sort. When we say that God is immutable, what we're saying is that God is not subject to any cause of being, that God is not made to be uh, by anything, but that he simply is. 
Put simply, causes make things to be. Therefore, if God is wholly self-sufficient in the plenitude of his being, he cannot be moved to some further actuality of being. He cannot become more than he was or less, as that would suggest some imperfection or absence of being in him. See what I'm getting at? If God became what he wasn't, then he once was not that. He once lacked that fullness of being. If God becomes what he was not, if God, become, if God ceases to be what he was, then he loses his actuality of being to just that extent. Now, that's okay for creatures. That's not okay for God. That's not, when we confess that God is immutable, when we confess that God does not change and that he's self-sufficient, we're saying that God cannot be made to be what he is by that which is not God, and he cannot begin to be what he wasn't or cease to be what he was. I, I'm saying this all very precisely, but I'm, I'm, take, I'm gonna take it that most of us are on board with this. <laughs> that God, God's godness is the fullness of his being. All right, the basis for this. Uh, first of all, I wanna just remind us of the doctrine of divine aseity. Dr. Renahan brought up divine aseity, uh, didn't give any explanation of it. Uh, I'm going to pause for just a moment. Divine aseity, let's face it, for most of us, maybe before seminary, maybe some of us after seminary, that wasn't in our ordinary language. Ase goodness, wisdom, justice, love, aseity. Which one of these seems a little out of place? Aseity, that's a strange word. It's an important word. It's where we need to begin. Herman Bovink begins with aseity. He's, he's right for beginning with aseity. What do we mean by that? Ase, the Latin ase means of himself, could mean from himself, but uh, I, I think we need to stay away from from himself because it sounds like self-causation. We'll talk about why that's a problem. Uh, when we say that God is of himself, what we're saying is that the complete sufficient explanation and reason for God's being just is God's being. God is not susceptible to an explanation or an account or reason for his being, existence, activity, that is somehow somewhat other than himself. God, maybe put it simply, God just is. Now, if you need a mnemonic device for this, this is, I, teach, I, teach this I teach theology proper to undergraduates, and we introduce aseity. We spend a good 50 minutes on aseity at the beginning of our semester, uh, and they all give me that puzzled look. If you need, this is my mnemonic device. If it doesn't help you, find something else. Um, if you need some help remembering aseity, for me, I always think of that, that Looney Tune character, Foghorn Leghorn. Do you, know, do you know Foghorn Leghorn? Foghorn Leghorn goes around, he tries, he's that rooster who bosses the, the hound dog and little chick around the barnyard, and what does he always say to the, the other animals? I'll say, I'll say, boy. <laughs> okay, well, look, if you can think Foghorn Leghorn and remember Aseity, then great. Something to get this word into your vocabulary. It's important that God is of himself, that God is not of another. The medievals would have said per aliud, by another, but he is per se, by himself and of himself. The full reason for God just is God. Bobink says, when God ascribes this aseity to himself in scripture, he makes known himself as absolute being, as the one who is in an absolute sense. By this perfection, he is at once essentially and absolutely distinct from all creatures. No creature is ase. No creature is of himself. We all live, move, and have our being from whom? God. God lives and moves and has his being of himself. He is the reason for his own being. Stephen Charnock says God is of himself. Uh, by the way, every time a Puritan says of himself, that's aseity. And you, when you see that now, when you read your Banner of Truth books and you see of himself, just think aseity. There it is. God is of himself, from no other. God hath no original. I love this. God is not a copy of anything. God, there's no exemplar form of God. God is. God isn't, the, God, isn't, God isn't the sketch of some more basic blueprint. God hath no original, he said. He says, he hath no defect because he was not made from nothing. He hath no increase because he had no beginning. In other words, I love this. I love the Puritans. God cannot increase in being because you, that which does not begin to be cannot begin to be more so. See what I'm saying? That which does not begin to be cannot begin to be. So he says, God hath no increase because he hath no beginning. He was before all things and therefore depends upon no other thing. The foundation of classical theism is the absoluteness of God in his existence, essence, and activity, that God does not begin to be what he was not. Rather, God is. We begin here. 
One clear implication of this doctrine is that God neither derives anything, no actuality of being. I'm going to keep saying that. I know it sounds awkward, but you'll get used to it by the end. Nothing derives, uh, does not derive anything from his creation, nor is he the cause of himself. A number of biblical passages support it. By the way, let me get this out of the way up front. Why would I say God is not the cause of himself? It's something like this. This, this violates all grammar rules, but a, a thing can't give what it ain't got, okay? If God gives himself being, he either already has the being he gives himself, or he gets the being from another and he's not all say. So I'll say it, he cannot, make, in other words, you can't, if I, if I take $5 out of my left pocket and put it in my right hand, have I given myself anything that I lacked? You see what I mean? God does not enrich himself. The being that God gives is the being that exists in him in plentitude, in, in, in infinity. God cannot augment that which is infinite. God cannot enrich that which has no boundary. God cannot give being to himself lest he first lacked it. And if he gives it to him from himself, that's absurd. Because he, because he receives nothing. He begins to be nothing he wasn't uh, eternally. All right, that out of the way. Job 22 2 and 3, Job's friend Eliphaz challenges Job with a set of rhetorical questions. He says first, can a, by the way, just hold on. I know that we, we tend to think, oh, Job's friends can't trust anything they say. Our, our forebearers were actually willing to derive quite a bit of theology out of Job. Uh, be patient. I think you'll find that God actually says many of the same things in the, in the epilogue of Job that Job's friends say. But Eliphaz says this, can a man be profitable unto God? as he that is wise is profitable unto himself. Is it any pleasure to the Almighty if thou art righteous? Or is it gain to him that you makest your ways perfect? I'm going to use a little bit of King James. I think sometimes it just puts a, a kind of a crisp sound on it that, that gets to the point. Can a man be profitable to God? Let me, let me put it to you this way. Is God better off because of you? Can a, man, can a man give to God what God lacks? Can a, man, can a man make himself of benefit to God so that God, in other words, does God ever have to say to man, thank you? <laughs> Folks, it's not impolite that God doesn't say thank you. Amen. God does not need to say thank you. He's, wor he's worthy of, you know, what, what should we say to him? But we have done, we are humble servants who've given him what is his due. God, God is no man's debtor. Can a man be profitable to God? Can God receive anything from man? God isn't better off because of us. Job 35, verse 7. Now the younger man, Elihu, comes in and says something very similar. He says, if thou be righteous, what givest thou him? In other words, does your righteousness give to God something God wouldn't have without your righteousness? That's what he's saying. If thou be righteous, what givest thou him? Or what receivest he of thy hand? Interesting. What does God receive from your hand? In the context, the, the rhetorical questions are a rebuke to Job's insistence that God owes him a hearing and an explanation regarding the calamity that came upon him. Job keeps saying, God needs to come and give, me, give an account of himself. And the point is, what does God owe you? What did you? In other words, what did you ever do for God that God is indebted to you? What did God receive from you that somehow he has now obligation to you? The force of the two rebukes is that God owes no man anything because he receives from no man. Now, yes, these are Job's friends, but God says something very similar in Job 41, verse 11. I'm quoting now the ESV because I think it gets the sense of this. It says, who has, given, who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. It's God speaking. Who has given to me that I should repay him? The term for given, uh, who is given to me, could be translated as confronted or come to be in front of me. Who has gotten out in front of me? But the idea is, the idea is that somehow you gave to God something and now you've put him in your debt. Who has, got, who has got God, you know, sort of on the hook? Who has put God in his debt by giving to God what God lacked? And the point is, God says, you can't give to me anything that I lack because I'm the one who gives to all. I'm not the one who receives from man. I'm the one who gives to all things, but receives from none. You don't enhance God. You don't make God a little better off. God does not receive from us. If I can put it this way also, when God gives, God does not give away. 
I think we need to get this in our minds. If I gave you $5, I may divest myself of $5, and my bottom, my bottom line just got a little poorer because I gave away some, some part of my wealth. And if you gave my $5 back to me, would I actually be receiving something from you that improved me? Yes, you see, if I first divested myself of that money and you possessed it, you possessed what I gave you, when you gave it back to me, you would, in a certain sense, re-enrich me. But when God gives, he does not give away. When God gives, he does not impoverish himself when he gives to all things, life, breath, and all things. When God gives to us, he does not divest himself so that we, when we give back to God, we sort of re-enrich him because he first impoverished himself. God says he gives these things to us and yet still owns them. And yet they still belong to him. God does not divest himself when he gives away. That which is perfectly infinite in being already possesses in himself the fullness of being. Acts 17 also establishes this aseity, the self-sufficiency. He says, uh, this is Paul speaking to the, to the philosophers on Mars Hill. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, he says, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the, the world and all things in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. It's the echo of uh, Solomon's dedication of the temple in, in 1 Kings 8, uh, 27 I think it is where Solomon says, will God indeed dwell on the earth? Uh, will God dwell in this temple that I have made? Even the heaven of heavens cannot contain him. Paul says he does not dwell in temples made with hands. And then he says two things, and we need to take note of this. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. I ask my students sometimes, do you serve God? Yes. Uh, why does Paul say that you don't? <laughs> What he means is that God is not given, God does not receive from us what he lacks. That our service to God is not an enrichment of God. Our service to God, what we give to God, is not an augmentation, an enrichment, an improvement of God. And then there's this little line, and be careful you don't read over, when you do your Bible reading, don't read over this little line, as though he needed anything. That's the irony. What could, what could God receive that he lacks? How could, that, how could the one who is infinite in being, fullness itself, whose very name is I am, be impoverished or divested of anything? See what I'm saying? In other words, God, is, God cannot receive from the creature. This, this does present a sort of problem for theistic personalism. If it's interpersonal dynamic reciprocity that we want, a little give and take, how can God be involved in a give and take relationship because God cannot receive what God lacks? God cannot begin to be what he was not, cannot receive from our hand uh, that which he lacks. He gives to all, but he receives from none. He says that he gives to all life, breath, and then if that weren't to say it all, all things. God is the giver, not the receiver of being. God is the one in whom we live, move, and have our being, but he does not inversely live, move, and have his being in us or in anything, not himself. God lives, I'll say. God lives in and of himself. We live and move, have our being, our very existence in him. So we live, move, have our being in him. If this is so, then there cannot be some actuality of being that we possess and that God lacks. Do you see what I'm saying? There's nothing you have to give to God that God does not have. God cannot be improved by us. Again, not that he divests himself of these things. Secondly, then, divine immutability. These are the basic claims of classical Christian theism. I'll say first and foremost, of himself. It follows from this that God is immutable. If God is fullness of being, if God is simply of himself, then God cannot be subject to change because all change is either an addition or a subtraction of being of some sort, of some, in some way. God's aseity leads to the conclusion of immutability. God cannot be made to be in any way that he is all, not already in and of himself. If he did, if such... If such happened, we'd have to explain how new actuality of being appeared in God. Where did that being come from? How did God begin to be what God was not? What is the, so what is the source of this new actuality in God? We'd also have to say that the one who gave God this new being, uh, that the one who gave God this new being, somehow had to borrow the Job 41 language, gotten out in front of God, put God in his debt. The immutable God 
may commit or oblige himself to bring about certain blessings or curses on his, on his creatures via covenant. We find that in Genesis 15. He can even swear by himself. God can obligate himself to man, but God does not divest himself in this obligation. God does not put himself in the need of man. God is not voluntarily choosing to be changed or moved by his creatures. A number of passages witness to his immutability. Numbers 23, 19, God does not repent. He's not a son of man that he should change his mind or that he should repent. Malachi 3, 6, we read earlier, I, the Lord, do not change. James 1, 17, God is the father of lights with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Hebrews 6 is actually one of the beautiful passages in this connection. It speaks about the covenant that God made with Abraham. In, in verse 16, it says, When God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by none, no one greater, he swore by himself. When did God swear by himself? He swore by himself in the promise to Abraham. Back in Genesis 15, 17, if you remember, he puts Abraham in a, dark, in a deep sleep, and he, divides the, he, he cuts the animals in half, and he divides the animals and lays them in two rows. And the, the symbol in the old, in the old uh, suzerainty covenant would be that, the, that, that together both parties, would both the, the suzerain and the vassal, would pass through the pieces. And the idea was, so let it be done to me if I break the terms of this covenant. And if, in a certain sense, let the curses of this covenant fall on me if I violate it. He puts Abraham to sleep. Abraham, interestingly, does not pass through the pieces. And God, in the, flame of, in the form of a flaming torch, passes through the pieces. In a certain sense, God is saying, let, let me, let me receive the covenant curses on myself if I do not keep this covenant to Abraham. And what he's saying is, as sure as I live, as sure as my life is, I swear by myself I will uphold, I will uphold this covenant. This covenant. Now, the writer of the Hebrews says God swore by himself because he could swear by none greater. This is what puts the assurance in his promise in the covenant. Later on, it says that God, desiring to show the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement and take hold of the hope before us. What's, what's the point of all that? The point of all that is this. That the assurance, uh, the assurance of God's promise is built on the unchangeableness of God's self. It's because God doesn't change that his promise doesn't change. It's very trendy nowadays to say that immutability really means nothing but constancy of character. That immutability simply means that God is faithful. But I want to use this one text as a challenge to that. Here, the covenant faithfulness itself is being staked is being staked and founded on the life of God so that what he's saying is the assurance of my covenant faithfulness is not just in the fact that I've always been covenantally faithful. The assurance of my covenantal faithfulness is in me, is in the fact that I do not change, that I swore by myself, by my own life. When, when in, in Exodus 32, when he threatens to cut off the children of Israel and make a nation out of Moses, Moses appeals to him and says, but you swore to our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you swore by yourself. Moses says, you can't break your covenant because you can't change. That's what he's saying. He, appeal, he actually uses immutability to appeal to God. One reason that God cannot change, no matter how small of the change is, is because it would signify some alteration in his being or his life. And if there is an alteration in the being or life of God, this destabilizes our confidence in the covenant. The uh, modern theologian Gilles Emery spotlights exactly what the question is in immutability. He says, a change requires the acquisition of something new the introduction of something that was not there before. To deny immutability signifies that God acts or finds himself in movement, that is in change, in alteration, in order to acquire something that he was previously lacking. And then Emery says this, and this would shatter the plentitude and perfection of being that pertains to him. That's right. That's profound. If God changes the stable foundation of all his covenantal promises and assurance, the thing that gives us great hope, is lost. A changing, God is, a changing God is not a matter of consolation. A changing God, which makes God seem so much more personal and interactive, a changing God is actually very bad news. 
shatters the plentitude of being that pertains to him. Charnock says, if God doth change, it must be either to a greater perfection that he had not before, or to a less. If to the better, he was not perfect, if it, uh, and was so not God. That is to say, if he becomes something more and he becomes better than he was, then he was not really God before because he once lacked some perfection of being. If to the worse, he will not be perfect, and so no longer God after that change. So the point is, you lose God either way. If God loses being, then he loses the fullness of perfection, and he's not worthy of the name God. If he gains being, then whatever he was before wasn't worthy of the name God. And the God who became is actually a God who just arrived on the scene because he wasn't that God prior to this change. This is, by the way, this is very bread and butter orthodoxy in older days. This would have, this would have, been, this would have been theology 101. This is not... This is not necessarily highbrow theology. You probably, if you were in the 17th century, you would have been sinking your teeth into this by about 15 or 16 years old. Okay? This, is, this stuff was, this was expected to be in the very marrow of our theology. So what's going on now? Have we lost that? Are we losing this doctrine of immutability? Plausible as classical theism's doctrines of divine aseity and immutability may appear, Many evangelical Calvinists are convinced that in their historic strong forms, they diminish other important aspects of God's being, such as his relatability through, and these are the words they use, genuine and mutual interaction with the world. Is God genuinely related? And what they mean by that is, does God, does God experience some kind of reciprocal relationship with me. If God is not moved in any way, he sounds like a cold, inert rock. If God can't change, then how can he be alive? Because we all know life has changed. Life is dynamic. Life is moving. The classical position seems to require that he can't be moved in any way. How can he genuinely relate to us and care for us if he's immovable? If you were immovable, you'd have a hard time caring about me or anyone else in your life. Why isn't it the same for God? Why doesn't God have to play by the same rules of being as we do? How can we have meaningful relationship with him and he with us if there is no give and take? Reciprocity and self-giving is the key to all significant relationships, is it not? This is the modern thinking. If God only gives to us but does not receive from us in turn, he seems to be missing out on a crucial component of the relationship. It's something, maybe you can think of it like this. It, it, it's sort of like the challenge you have every Christmas. How do you give a gift to somebody who has everything? You know, it's the disappointment of, of giving to somebody. They open up the package and they say to your face, I've already got one of these. Kind of puts a, kind of puts a damper on the relationship. Uh, what do you give to God that God lacks? You see, it's, it's, more, it's, much, more, it's much more personal and dynamic, and, and we can appreciate it if God receives what he did not have. The austerity of the classical Christian theism seems to say that we cannot genuinely contribute to the life of God. Folks, what I'm going to argue as we unpack a little bit of this is that that's, that's not bad. That's not, that's not bad. That's actually good news. That's the, that's the foundation of our comfort, that God is in fact fullness of being. If, if, if for a brief moment, it might seem attractive to say that God can receive what he lacked, but on second thought, no. That's, that, 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 that's the erosion of the very foundation of our covenantal hope and assurance. The burning question then is, does the world make a difference to God? It's unimaginable that any Christian would want to give a negative answer to that question. And in a certain sense, if what is meant by the question is, does God genuinely care about the world, then we must give a positive answer. We must say, of course God genuinely cares about the world. But when we say, does the world make a difference to God, that's putting it a little bit differently. Is God affected by the world? Is he moved by the world? Is he changed by the world? How one goes about explaining God's care for the world and the nature of his relationship to it is precisely, I think, where the difficulty lies today. How does he care for the world in such a way that he allows creatures to move? Does he care for the world in a way where he allows creatures to move him, to change him? Or does he care for the world in a way in which his being remains in perfect felicity and beatitude, perfect self-enjoyment of himself, unchanged and untouched in his intrinsic being and fullness. Now I need to mention 
a few of those, I think, who, have, who are striking out on a different path. And, I, and I, I, I mention these aware that many of us have benefited from certain aspects of t some of the teachings of these men. And I certainly by no means intend these criticisms to be a wholesale dismissal of everything that they've ever written. But what I want to suggest is that perhaps they've been leading us in a direction that is not uh, entirely sound. Bruce Ware argues, for, argues that we need to change our doctrine of immutability. In 1984, his PhD dissertation at Fuller Seminary was entitled, An Evangelical Reexamination of the Doctrine of the Immutability of God. And in this dissertation and in subsequent publications after that, uh, uh, an article that appeared in Jets in 1986, uh, one that appeared the next year, in the Westminster Theological Journal, uh, and then in a series of books in which he was combating open theism near the turn of the century, uh, God's Lesser Glory, I think followed a few years later by God's Greater Glory. I'm, I'm sure that many in this room have, have benefited from things in those books. Uh, I remember 15 years ago consuming those books and thinking that Ware was standing in the breach defending classical Christian orthodoxy. Um, but the question is, does he? He calls in 1984 for a, he says, a re-examination, but what he really is asking is that we, re that we massage and, 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 and change certain aspects of our doctrine of immutability. He insists upon God's ontological unchangeable, unchangeableness, that his being cannot change in rather traditional terms. He says, uh, he, says uh, he speaks of the intrinsic immutability of God's own nature, and yet he also contends that God's involvement with creation, quote, includes innumerable changes on both on the part of God and on the part of his creatures. And Ware calls this, his words, relational mutability. Now, if by relational mutability he means that God eternally wills to change the dispensations of his dealings in history with man from one moment to another, I think there wouldn't be a problem. I wouldn't want to call that mutability. Uh, I would just want to say that God unchangeably, unchangeably wills changes in time in terms, of his, in terms of his, what we say, odd extra, or external dealings with creation. But that's not what Ware means. He's talking about a relational mutability in God. And this is very clear in his 86 article. He means that God relates to creatures in virtue of some new actuality of being that he assumes, that comes, in, comes about in him. He called it namely the relation. And this relation is in God, but is somehow distinct from his nature. Listen to his language on God, what he calls God's dispositions. He says of God, he changes from anger to mercy, from blessing to cursing, from rejection to accept, acceptance. Now, if he's just talking about God's extrinsic dealings with the world, Okay, but then he says this, each of these changes is real in God. That's a different proposition entirely. He's arguing for what we call ad intra or internal changes in, in God. He says, he goes on, though no such change affects in the slightest the unchangeable supremacy of his intrinsic nature. So you've got an unchangeable nature in God but you also have states of anger, mercy, blessing, cursing, rejection, acceptance that are also states of being, I would take it, that are real in God but are not his nature. So there is something in God that is not his nature and there are other states of being in God that he has in addition to his nature. Again, each of the changes, he says, is real in God. He clearly accepts two different realities in God simultaneously. There's the natural reality of his nature or his essence, and the other is the acquired reality of his dispositions. So there's God's dispositions in God and God's nature in God, and the dispositions can change and become and alter, but God's nature remains the same. Folks, um, that, this, not, to be, not to be sacrilegious, um, that's true of me. My nature has never, I, I have been angry, I have been... I've been happy, uh, I, have, I have acted in one way and acted in another. All these changes are real in me, they are real dispositional changes, and yet my human nature has never been changed in the least by them. My human nature is what gives me my whatness, it's what makes me what I am. That human nature has not been changed. So all these changes in me haven't changed my nature either. In other words, I don't think he's offering us anything particularly interesting here. In fact, the only thing that makes it interesting is how God can have being in himself with changes and being in himself which remains constant. 
What does he mean by that? The older metaphysically minded theologians would have described Ware's position as saying that there's a distinction in God between his substance, his nature, his substantial form or his nature, and accidents, basically qualities of being that, can, that God can acquire and lose. According to Ware, some realities in God are identical to his divine nature and some are not. And it's in these latter non, non-essential but still intrinsic actualities of God's being that he locates the changes. Now, there are theistic personalist motivations for what Ware is doing. Ware is, he calls this a reformulation of the doctrine of immutability. Um, I think refu- reformulation is much too tame, but we can clearly see his, his personalist motives in his language from God's lesser glory. I think uh, 2000 this book came out. He says, divine immutability is best understood as involving God's unchangeable nature, what he just calls ontological immutability, his unchangeable promise, ethical immutability. He says, but scripture does not lead us to think of God as unchangeable in every respect. Absolute immutability. So there's ontic immutability, there's ethical immutability, but there's not absolute immutability. He says, importantly, God is changeable in relationship with his creation. That's the personalism. That's the give and take that he wants. Particularly with human and angelic moral creatures, he has made to live in relationship with him. In this relational mutability, God does not change in his essential nature, purpose, will, knowledge, or wisdom, but he does interact with his people in the the experiences of their lives as these unfold in time. He goes on, God actually enters into relationship with his people while knowing from eternity what they will face. What he's saying is that there is something in God by which God experiences change. First of all, and I'm just going to make a quick note of this, um, to say that there are changes in God that somehow are not ontological changes in God is absurd. How can something be real but not be part of what is? Ontology is the study of being. How can you have something real that is not an aspect of being? But you know something, and let's face it, I I did this too when I read this book 15 years ago. That's kind of a hard thing to think about. It's difficult to think about what does ontology mean? Uh, Is ontology, when we say the ontology of James is not just with respect to my nature, my humanity, it's also with respect to all those accidental features of my being, the total package, the total substance. Um, I am am comprised of substantial form, humanity, and accidents. Accidents would be those changeable features of my being. Not a lot of hair, five foot eight, could have been six foot, and all the features of my being that aren't necessary to my humanity, but they are also, they're part of my being, those are also ontological. When Ware, when Ware says that there are changes in God, but don't worry, they're not ontological, then I have to ask the question, then are the changes real? Because ontology studies what is, ontology studies being. And if the answer, and of course he's already said they're real, so I have to say either they're ontological or they're not ontological, but if they're not real, <clears throat> then pardon me, but let's just move on to the next subject. Because <laughs> what are we even talking about? What is a, non, what is a non-real change that is really in God? I, I, don't, I don't comprehend that. Um, and I, I don't think I'm going to either. Uh, secondly, Ware says, Ware says that God actually enters into relationship with his people. I don't want to say that's wrong, but, I, but what he means is he enters into relationship with his people such that he is moved by and enters into time with them and in a certain sense experiences changes that are real in him in that relationship. It's, it's the way he qualifies that relationship that is problematic. He depicts it as if God is somehow moving along with them in a kind of synergistic sense. Not that God isn't in control. Where wants to say all along, no, God's totally in control of this interaction, but there is a kind of real give and take going on. God has voluntarily opened himself up to being affected or moved or acted upon by his creatures uh, and changed by them. Now he will say God controls the changes, so it's okay. And I want to say self-controlled change is still mutability. That, that's, that's still not a doctrine of immutability. It's still an ontolo- there's still an ontological openness in God for where. God can begin to be what God was not, even if his, where says, even if that's not touching his nature, it still touches him intrinsically. The driving conviction seems to be that anything less than this would not count as meaningful interaction, and the relationship, and the relationship between God and his creatures would somehow suffer as a result of this. Now, this is important. 
Because Ware, the context of a lot of Ware's work is his, is his contest with open theism. When I read Ware, and I have to, I, this is a personal note to this, when I read Ware 15 years ago on this, I was probably like many of you, very thankful that he was standing up against the denial of exhaustive foreknowledge and predestination on the part of open theism. He was fighting their, their he was basically fighting the free will aspect of, of open theism that leaves, that leaves God somehow uncertain about the future. And on that, I, I really have no complaint with Ware. But what I didn't realize he was doing at the time, and it seems to me now he was doing, is he was, he was selling out ontological immutability uh, and trading it, as it were, for sovereignty. What, listen to this language. This is him now speaking to the open theists, and then I want to say what I think is going on here. He says this in, uh, in God's Lesser Glory. Open theists are certainly right to seek to ground and embrace the real relationship between God and his human creatures, particularly his own people. By real relationship, he means a give and take relationship. He goes on, classical theism is vulnerable at this point and is in need of some correctives on the, on the question of relation. In other words, classical theism doesn't let God be moved by creation. Where thinks that needs some correction. He says, however, the classical model can be modified and can sustain the real, vibrant, and reciprocal relationship between God and others. C can, you, can, you have an can you have an all say infinite God who is in a reciprocated relationship with something not himself? I rather doubt it. That seems much more like a demolition than a modification. I, get, I go on. What simply is wrong... He's saying, he says, what simply is wrong is the notion that to uphold the real relatedness of God with others, one must adopt some new version of free will theism. So what he's saying is, my problem with open theism is not that they are saying God undergoes certain changes. My problem with open theism is that they have, they have located the source of the changes in the wrong place. Open theism was wrong because open theism thinks that man is the ultimate source of change in God, relational change. Ware wants to say, <clears throat> I agree with you on relational changes in God, but I disagree with you on who causes them. I want to say that God causes the changes in himself. My point is this. Ware's ontology of God is basically the same as the open theists. He believes that God's being is susceptible to alteration, to augmentation, and to change, Maybe not his essence, uh, but something in him can be changed. And he says to the open theist, I agree with you. I think it's something like this, and not to put it too crassly. Um, it's something like a bargain in which he says, look, I'll give, you I'll give you a mutable God if you give me sovereignty. I'll give up, I'll give up absolute immutability from my side if you'll give up free will theism from your side. I think what we have here is really just an intramural debate between theological mutabilists and where is, where is among them. He's arguing simply for who causes the changes, not whether there are changes. Um, he certainly understates his departure from the tradition when he says, obviously, some reformulation of classical theism is involved here, but the end product is really only a variation and refinement of the classical model. I think that's severely understated. I think if we follow out the implications of Ware's proposal, in truth, we end up with a God who is strikingly unlike what we find in our confession or in the classical model, as he calls it. God is mutable in being. He can acquire relations and dispositions of actuality that he, la that he lacked. God is passable. He's able to be moved to new affective states of being by creatures. God is composed of parts because he has in him that which is his nature and that which is not his nature. There are non-essential actualities in God and essential actualities in God. Uh, we will get to simplicity later and talk about that. Uh, he is finite in being to the extent that he can begin to be what he was not. Again, because he locates these changes in God. God is temporal. Some aspect of his being is made to travel along in time with creatures, and God is certainly not what I would say most absolute, as he is made to be actual by virtue of those states of relationality that he acquires from his creatures and which are not strictly identical with his essence. In other words, there's something in God 
that is real, that relates God to us, but that something in God is not God. It's not his nature. It's not his divinity that makes him actual in those cases. More on that later. Hold on to that. I'm only pointing out Ware's partings from, the classical, from classical theism not to single him out as uniquely progressive or daring, but because his views, I think, represent a standard case of what is now perhaps the prevailing view among evangelical Calvinists. That it's okay to say that God changes in non-essential ways as long as we say that God is controlling and choosing the changes. Folks, that's nothing like what our confession is offering us. And the implications, if we tease them out, are actually quite in a different, quite in a different direction. Not a modification, but something else. Others have done this. Where is not the first? And I don't want to say he is sort of the source of all of this. This has been going on before him. J. Oliver Buswell does, makes certain moves like this in his theology in the middle of the last century. He speaks about God's relationship uh, to the world, and he maintains that the love of God as represented throughout the scriptures is totally denied if it does not imply some specific chronological relationships between God and his creatures, that God has temporal relations with his creed, that God has to, in some measure, temporalize himself in order to really meaningfully love his creatures. That's what Buswell's saying. He says that if God does not experience change over time, and read his section on eternity, he does not like the classical eternity doctrine. He's very clear about that. Um, if God doesn't experience some kind of change in relationship over time, his, quote, intimate actual relationships with his people... If this doesn't happen, then he says, the love of God is reduced to his words, the frozen wastes of pure speculative abstraction. Whatever that is, it doesn't sound very personal or loving or anything that I want. Ronald Nash, uh, Ronald Nash follows the Jesuit scholar W. Norris Clark um, and concludes that classical theism can somehow be modified to be reconciled with process theism's demand for a God who is, quote, really related to us and thus affected by the creatures who worship him. Buswell and Nash's position anticipates, I think, what's later developed by Ware. Nash says, the Christian theist can recognize senses in which even an immutable and perfect God can change. An immutable and perfect God can be mutable. I'm trying, that's, in other words, what, what's, what they do though is they want to say, it, it's not exactly a contradiction. They want to say there are certain aspects of his being that are not mutable, uh, his nature, and there are other aspects of his being, let us call them accidents, that are. That's what they're doing. They're divi the, the way to pull this off is to have a God who is composed of parts. We'll talk about that later. Human beings, he says, human beings, uh, he says, can make a difference to God. D.A. Carson says, even the most superficial reading of Scripture discloses God to be, his words, a personal being who interacts with us. And precisely how does God interact with us? According to Carson, God's love for the world is, quote, a vulnerable love that feels pain, close quote. That's, that's, that's the real, genuine relationship. All right, how are we going to keep all this from getting out of hand? Think of it like this. I think what happens with Ware in his 84 dissertation is he, he dials down slightly the strength of God's immutability. That seems to create a problem. And I think in order to sort of fill in the vacuum, in order to, in order to make sure that things don't get out of hand now that we are arguing for relational accidental mutability in God, in order to sort of save that from getting out of hand, he dials up the strength of sovereignty in order, to, in order to make sure that God's now changeable life is still under God's control. And he proposes that, in fact, God is the one controlling the changes in himself. So dialing down immutability, making God sovereign over his own intrinsic actuality, folks, that's, that's a God who is making himself to be. That's a God who is controlling the movements in, in his being. Bart speaks about a holy mutability in God that is assumed under his lordship. Thomas Tracy, in his 1984 book, God, Action, and Embodiment, actually argues for something similar to this. He says there, we must not exclude the possibility that God may establish a relation to creatures in which he is genuinely affected by them and yet does not cease to be God. What he's saying is that creatures can change him. He says before that, should we say that God is actus purus, pure act in the scholastic sense, we would not be able to understand his relation to creatures and their history except in his function as ultimate cause, reducing potentiality to actuality and other things without himself undergoing change. If we say that God 
is full of being, pure act, then God can't change. And we all know that change is the fundamental thing for relationship. Tracy says that, the openness of be, that this openness of being acted upon by creatures is within God's power. So Tracy says, God's continued existence cannot be dependent upon the actions of another being, listen to this, unless he intends that it be. <laughs> what? God can't be dependent upon something not God unless he chooses to be dependent on something not God. That's what he's offering. Now you think, well, oh, that's a he's a he's a soft process theist. I grant that. He does he does say that yes, this is a doctrine of self-creativity. We are going to have to sort of bite the bullet and say God creates aspects of his life. He says God can be said to be self-creative in the sense that he determines the content of his own existence. Wow, God's existence is now the effect, is now the effected consequence of God's will. God is making God to be he says that as he freely prescribes the pattern and activity that constitutes his life. Now we might think to ourselves, okay, that's, but that Thomas Tracy is really, that's, who is that even? You, most of you don't even know. You have no idea who this is. He doesn't affect you. He's a kind of, he's a kind of, uh, of soft process theist. Um, J.I. Packer says, God's experiences do not come upon him as ours come upon us, for his are, wait, watch this, for his are foreknown. Wait a minute, God does have experiences that come upon him. The difference is, for Packer, God foreknows them, willed and chosen by himself, and are not involuntary surprises forced on him outside, watch this, apart from his own decision in the way that ours regularly are. So God can be acted upon and can have things and can be affected from the outside if he chooses to be, if he voluntarily chooses to be acted upon. He goes on about God's feelings in his book, Concise Theology. God's, and I'll, we're, we're done in a moment, so hang, hang with me. I know everyone's thinking tacos and it'll be tacos in a second. He says, God's feelings are not beyond his control that's the new word. Now control is, the, control is the new operative power that God exercises, watch this, over God. I think actually classical Christian theism actually probably has a basis to say that God is not self-controlled. In other words, the will is not some power in God over other aspects of God. God is, they're not sort of, there's not a hierarchy in God of will and then everything else. We need to get away from that, but we'll get there. He says, God's feelings are not beyond his control, as ours often are. Theologians express this by saying that God is impassable. They mean not that he is impassive and unfeeling by what, by what he feels, but, or, but that, he, that what he feels, like what he does, is a matter of his own deliberate, voluntary choice, included in the uni unity of his infinite being. So God feels, God is moved, but he's choosing it for himself. He goes on, God is never our victim in the sense that we make him suffer where he had not first chosen to suffer. So what he's saying is you can make God suffer, but not as the ultimate source of his suffering. It's only if he chooses to have you make him suffer, undergo change, be acted upon. Scripture expressing, he goes on, the reality of God's emotions abound, however, and it is a great mistake to forget that God feels. Just there's a book. Confessing the impassable God, just, you know, 400 pages against this, but uh, I'll, leave that for, I'll leave that for you. Though, he says, though in a way of necessity that transcends finite beings, what Packer is saying is that God can feel emotions, suffer, be acted upon by creatures as long as he's the one who is in control and choosing it. Finally then, self-controlled mutability is advanced by Rob Lister. Some of you have read my, my criticism of Lister. Lister basically argues that God cannot be moved by creatures his, his emotions are not involuntarily or unexpectedly wrung from him, but rather he wants to say that God can have emotions wrung from him as long as he's the one who wills that creatures wring them from him. As long as he sovereignly wills the wringing, it's okay. Tra this would be, to Tracy's point, God cannot be dependent upon the actions of creatures unless he chooses to be. In Packer's point, God doesn't suffer action upon himself unless he chooses to. Also, it's clear that Lister does not merely mean that God changes in the manifestation of himself. He says, he says that the changes, the responsiveness to, to creatures involves a transition that occurs in God, his words. A transition that occurs in God. He calls this God's emotional sovereignty, sovereign emotional lordship, he calls it. Lordship over who? 
lordship over himself. God is now the Lord of God. That's, I don't find that in the, I don't find that in the older, in, in the reformed scholastics or, or in Thomas Aquinas or in, or in Augustine or Athanasius. So what I'm saying? I don't, I don't find this in the, great, in the great voices. I certainly don't find this uh, in our confession that God is now in control of God. God is Lord and sovereign now over his own being. All right, I finished with this. What's the, what's the cost of all this modification of classical theism, of this, of this introduction of theistic personalism? If one follows this path, we, we're going to have to say, in a certain sense, God controls his own mutability, and it turns out that if God so chooses, that a vigorous man can be profitable to God, the words of Job. And if God chooses, a righteous man can produce pleasure in him, using Job's words. And if God so chooses, it is gain to him if you make your ways perfect. You see what I'm saying? The control thesis says that God can open himself up to receiving from creatures. He can be served by human hands if he chooses to be. This is, this is a new idea. These outcomes are no less real simply because God chooses to place himself in the position of dependency upon creatures. In a certain sense, this is on a, on a collision course with aseity and immutability. God must live, move, and have his being in some respect in creatures because he has chosen to have them act upon him and move him to some new state. A.W. Pink said, and this is very traditional, says that God gives to all as an, and is enriched by none. I think that's a nice pithy way of putting it. Gives to all as an, and is enriched by none. But those who have fallen under the spell of theistic personalism can't say this. Rather, they must say that God gives to all and in turn freely chooses to be enriched by some at his discretion. See what I'm getting at? I think this is, I think this is the, the slight sh shift where we've gone. My other question is this. If God's immutability can be, can be uh, suspended or, as it were, augmented by some mutability, what else can God suspend or augment? In other words, in other words what other attributes uh, can God sovereignly choose to not live according to? In other words, uh, what else can God modify or negate? Can God choose not to be eternal, simple, infinite? Can he, can, can he choose to be finite? Is he free to choose finitude for himself? Composition for himself, temporality for himself. Can he choose mortality? Can he choose limitation of knowledge? Can he, be, can he choose to be impotent in certain regards? Can he choose to not be omnipresent? In other words, if, we're, if we can say that God can choose not to be absolutely immutable in every respect, then what else can God choose absolutely not to be in every respect? This is my concern uh, with the truth. I'm not saying that everyone's walking down this path. I'm saying I'm not sure why they're not. I'm not sure why this door hasn't been opened. And what about the moral attributes of God? Um, can God choose to suspend or augment and be something other than his love, mercy, justice, or truthfulness? Is this also at his voluntary discretion? See what I'm saying? I, I'd hope we wouldn't say that. My conclusion is that theistic personalism, this desire that God be in some give and take, is like an acid that burns through a whole host of traditional orthodox doctrines uh, and teachings about God. And when its work is done, the result looks rather unlike a variation or refinement of classical Christian theism and much more like a demolition and wholesale replacement. Now, what makes this difficult is they've rebuilt something in its place, but they keep using the same language. <laughs> They keep using the language of immutability. They keep using the language of infinity and perfection and fullness of being. And they keep, they keep saying all the right things, but the, but the structure doesn't fit anymore because now God becomes what he was not because he chooses to allow himself to become what he was not in some non-essential way. We'll talk later about why that's, why that's problematic. All right. I leave it with this, and I know we're, I know we're late, but my last text. Acts 15, uh, Acts 14, rather. Uh, Paul, and, uh, Paul and Barnabas are in uh, Lystra, and they are mistaken for being the gods uh, Zeus and Hermes. And if you, if you know your confession, you look at the proof text for God without passions, it points you to Acts 14, 15, and you, and you open it up. Like in my New American Standard, I, I, I open up that text, and I read there, men, why are you doing these things? We are men of the same nature as you. And I've always, I always thought... How do they get God without passions from a text that doesn't say anything about passions? 
But in fact, then you read the, New, you read the King James and it says, we are not of men of like passions with you. Or you read the Young's literal translation, we are not men like affected with you. If I could put it this way, the people are calling Paul and Barnabas, Zeus and Hermes, and Paul and Barnabas tear their clothes and say, men, you know, don't worship us, we're, we're creatures, and this is how they say it. They said, men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of like passions with you, or like affected with you, and we preach for you to turn from these things to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. They use this term, homoiopathes, which means literally, like you acted upon or like you subject to being acted upon. The, the TDNT says that pathes or pasco means basically to experience that which comes from without and which has to be suffered. We are men who are acted upon. And what he's saying is, what he's saying, they're not saying we're not Zeus and Hermes. Look, the gods on Mount Olympus, are they passable or impassable? Do they change or do they not change? They change. They, sometimes they're throwing down you know, lightning bolts, and sometimes they're falling in love with creatures, and they're fighting amongst themselves. And the, the God, Zeus and Hermes are very passable gods. And what they're saying is not turn from us, and, and, and that we're not really gods. They're saying turn from Zeus and Hermes as well. Turn from that which receives action from another. Turn from that which is like affected with another, and serve the God who made all things, the, the heavens, the earth, and all that is in them. I, I think what they're saying, the juxtaposition between the creator God and the whoever is homoeopathes with you, like affected as you, is the difference between the God who gives to all, the creator, and the gods who receive from others. I'll close with this. Their point is that we should worship the one who gives to all but receives from none. The one who gives to all life, breath, and all things, and in whom we live, move, and have our being is the object of our worship. If he in turn voluntarily chose to live, move, and have his being in creatures, even if he controlled it with his will, we'd have a major problem because Paul and Barnabas are saying we ought not worship that, that that's vain that we worship the one who creates and gives to all. All right, thanks for your patience with the extra minutes. Let me pray. Our God and Father, we do bless you and we thank you, God, that you are unchanging, eternal, infinite in your being, and that you have showered your blessings upon us in your Son and poured forth your Spirit upon us by which we are united to your crucified and resurrected Son. And Lord, we bless you that you are indeed the unchanging God's perfect and unchanging in your way so that we can trust your promises and have unshakable hope. We bless you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.